Welcome to week 10 revision. So someone who has fled their home but not crossed an international border to seek sanctuary would be classified as which of the following? Yeah, it's an internally displaced person. Because in order to be a refugee or an asylum seeker, you need to cross the border of your country. And the difference between those two is that an as as asylum seeker is someone who hasn't yet been officially granted refugee status um, by some organization. And the green option is just a made up um, term. Which of the following is better for refugees? Um, okay, so this one is offshore processing because offshore processing is kind of on counterintuitive. What it means is that before coming to Australia, they obtain some kind of visa, um, which means that when they come here, they are granted like um, money and protection by the Australian government. Whereas onshore processing is the refugees who just arrive um, straight away um, without any like legal processing before they arrive. So for example, they might be arriving by boat um, and that's when they're taken to the detention centers which can ultimately end up being worse for their health and like overall well-being. Which of the following is not a part of the ACID guidelines? Yeah, so the mnemonic that I used to remember the ACID guidelines was ASK. So ask, screen, kindness. Uh, so in ask, make sure you ask them about their um, past history and their overall health up to that point. In screen, make sure you screen them for specific diseases. So I think in the lectures, um, they talk about screening for like um, schistosomiasis and hepatitis and so on. And then kindness is just about taking into account the fact that they are new to this country and they might not be aware of the healthcare system. So just to try and extend that extra support. Yeah. So is it preferable to use family members as interpreters? Yeah, it's not preferable to do this. And the reason is because it can interfere with the accuracy of the translation because for an instance, if there's bad news, then family members might not end up revealing that to the patient. And there's also no way to know the, their personal skill level in English as well, because they, as people who aren't professional translators, might not be able to understand everything that you're saying as well. So which of the following is a post-arrival factor? Uh, yeah, so a post-arrival factor is just something that's going to affect refugees after they've entered Australia. Uh, so in this case, language barrier. All the other three um, options that I've listed are all pre-arrival factors, since they impact the refugees' health, um, all occurring before they arrived in Australia. So which is missing from the chain of infection here? Um, yep, so, okay, no one got this right. So the answer is reservoir slash source. Um, so I believe this is from Ashvini's 
slides from week nine. Um, just give me a second to see if I can find something about the chain. Um, okay. Strangely enough, doesn't seem to cover that, but oh, right, sorry, week nine revision, my bad. Okay, wait, never mind. I just realized what <laughs> Right, okay, so just to be clear, um, yep, so reservoir um, slash source is the missing part and breaking the chain will prevent the spread and transmission of infections. So that's, that's that. Yep, so from week nine, if you remember, um, the chain of infection reservoir is where the agent survives plus multiplies. So we have humans, animals, and inanimate objects, also known as fomite. Um, and the types of carriers for humans are incubatory slash asymptomatic carriers for HIV, like HIV. There's convalescent carriers, um, so like, even if you've recovered from the infection, you can still be a carrier. So for example, salmonella, and there's chronic carriers. So the health is just constantly deteriorating. So for example, hepatitis B. And acute is definitely not a type of reservoir or carrier. Yeah, so that's just that slide. Um, yep, sorry, having some technical difficulties. Um, okay, so some portals of entry, um, actually they include respiratory, there's conjunctiva or the eye, there's urogenital, gastrointestinal, skin and placenta. So these all answers are actually applicable here. Yep. Yep, so direct trans direct contact means that there is transmission through a, it, sorry, does not mean that there is transmission through a fomite. So hence the answer is false. So a fomite will be included in indirect contact and direct contact is person to person. Um, yeah, so transplacental means, um, it means transmitted from mother to baby through the blood placental barrier. And clearly all three, three of those, except for chickenpox are transmitted this way. Just that's, um, oh, actually there is a, sorry, there is a mnemonic to remember that. So there's, it's called torch. So there's toxoplasmosis, other, so like syphilis, varicella zoster, and parvovirus, R for rubella, C for cytomegalovirus and H for herpes. So that's how you remember those five diseases. There you go.
right, excellent. So all four of those are correct. Um, yeah, and okay. So to be clear, yes, cleaning definitely will prevent disease transmission and uh, it should occur prior to sterilizing or disinfecting procedures. Um, it should be used for non-critical items that may be in contact with skin but not penetrate. So for example, stethoscope. There are indeed four methods of sterilization. Uh, so can, okay, um, does someone, anyone want to tell me what the four methods of sterilization are? Okay, so I'll, I'll just say them. Um, there's moist heat, ster moist heat sterilization, dry heat sterilization, ionizing radiation and filtration. And yes, disinfection is necessary for, just for equipment like endoscopes. And disinfection does kill most um, viable organisms. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yep, there you go. Oh, um, actually, wait, this might be my question. Hold on a second. I'm sure it is. Um, so, yep, it is true that MHC class 1 markers are found only faded cells and interact with CD8 T cells. Actually, I don't remember making this question. This, um, I think this is Ashani's as well. Oh, okay, right, right. Um, I don't actually see it in her slides. Oh, right, never mind, never mind, yes. So MHC class one is on all nucleated cells. It interacts with CD8 T cells plus natural killer cells and um, yeah, presents intracellular molecules. Yeah, that's, that's it. Yeah, that's the slide for that. My bad. Yep, good job. So all three of three of those are correct. So just to um, reiterate, allergy and helminths belong to IgE, sorry, pr produce IgE. Fungi produce IgG. Um, gut infections produce IgA. Blood infections, IgM and IgG. And viral infections produce IgG, IgA. So clearly that's gut infections is wrong to be IgA. Yep, there we go. Excellent job. Uh, well, all four of those actually um, are carried out by antibodies. And let's see if there's there's some other roles here as well. Let's just see what hasn't been covered. Um, so we have neutralization of microbes and toxins. That's there. Opsonization, phagocytosis of microbes. Um, we have lysis of microbes and initiating inflammation. And besides those, there's also antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity. So working with natural killer cells. And there's um, uh, phagocytosis of microbes opsonization by complement fragments. Yep. So those are some extra roles carried out by antibodies. There you go. Correct, that is false. Um, so the correct phases, the correct order of the phases is in fact, first one, recognition phase, two, activation phase, three, effector phase. 
and uh, four decline via homeostasis and five memory of the response. The future purpose. Yeah, there you go. Yep, so that is true. The types of MHC marker that the antigen interacts with alters the types of adaptive immune response. And I believe there should be, um, there could be a slide in the next one. So maybe we can just go. Yep, good. So MHC class one is on all nucleated cells, um, interacts. So I think we went through that first part before. Um, MHC class two is only on antigen present cells, present foreign material for pathogens. Um, yeah, and I can. I guess you can read the rest of that. Yeah. Cool. Moving on. Yep. So this is my bit. Um, yep. So platelet plug is definitely one of them. Basic constriction as well. And um, instead of disintegration, it's actually formation and vasodilation is not there. So there's three steps. Um, okay, which of the following are steps for primarily platelet plug formation? Yep, wonderful. So fibrinolysis does not occur at this point, um, but everything else listed here does happen. I think we should have an explanation slide. Yes. Okay, so, yep, so first of all, because of the injury, the ECM is exposed, and then the platelets come and adhere to that exposed ECM. And following this, they are activated, so then additional platelets also come, and then fibrinogen forms bridges. Um, to block the areas of damage. So this is like the first step. Okay, vitamin K is required for the synthesis of which coagulation factors? Yeah, perfect. So like the way that they said to memorize this is just to think about the main TV channels. Um, yeah. What is... APPT. Yep, so it is the blue option. It measures the function of the intrinsic common pathway. Um, it's actually activated partial thromboplastin time. That was just a mean question. Um, and there should be an explanation slide, I think after two more questions, but it'll go over everything. Which of the following is true? Um, yep, so D dimer tests, tests fibrinolysis that occurred recently, um, not a while from a while ago. Um, PT tests for abnormalities in these factors, so that's correct. And then fibrinogen tests um, deficiency. Um, and if we go to the next question, I think after this, there should be an explanation slide. Okay, which of the following are hemostatic function tests? Yep, so all of them are um, hemostatic function tests. And then um, the D-dimer tests and then the um, prothrombin time, those things come under coagulation um, 
screening tests as well. Um, and if we go, I think, yeah, awesome. Okay, so these are the um, hemostatic function tests, and then those are some of the ones that come under the coagul coagulation screening tests. Um, yep, so there's um, PT, APTT, and then TT, and that kind of goes with the coagulation cascade. It tests different parts of it. Um, and then D-dimer is testing any recent ongoing fibrinolysis and then fibrinogen levels is any tests any, for any deficiency. Um, and then, so this just goes and shows you how it tests the different parts of the pathways. So APPT tests the intrinsic common pathway, including the common pathway as well. Um, PT is the extrinsic one, and then TT is just the common pathway. Um, yeah. So which of the following are part of Virchow's triad? Okay, so um, the so endothelial damage is one of them. Abnormal coagulation is also another one, and then abnormal blood flow is the third one. The other two are not part of the triad. Yeah, um, so this is just um, it. Virchow's triad is to um, is about thrombosis um, and. That's basically when clots can form. Um, yeah. Okay, which of the following is true about fibrinolysis? Okay, so plasmin does break down the fibrin um, and then TPA and UPA activates the plasminogen and turns it into the plasmin. So this one's wrong. Plasminogen becomes plasmin, not the other way around. And then fibrin is broken down into these fragments as well. Yep, uh, and this is just a depiction of that. Which of the following is true about coagulation factors? Okay, so all of these are correct, but it's synthesized in the liver, not the pancreas. Um, three pathways, so the intrinsic, extrinsic, and then the common. Um, and yep, yeah, they're activated in secondary hemostasis. hemostasis. Um, yep. Um, and so this is just a depiction of the coagulation cascade. Um, yeah, and here you can see that fibrinogen becomes fibrin with the help of thrombin there. Yeah. Which of the following is true about the hemostatic response? Yep, so I just mentioned that the coagulation factors are activated in the secondary hemostasis, um, but everything else here is true. Um, so this is just a little bit more about 
secondary hemostasis. So remember the primary platelet plug formation is what activates the secondary hemostasis. Um, yep. So what are some signs of a hemostatic disorder? Yep, um, so um, the next slide should have a list of the different signs. Um, yep, so there could be um, purpura, which is just bleeding on the skin, um, bleeding in other areas such as um, in joints and also bleeding after surgery. And there could also be an inability to clot um, because of any um, defects in the coagulation cascade or anything like that as well. Yep. So just confirming, Lashitha, you can hear me, yeah? Yep. Right. Yeah. So the preferred route of drug administration is oral, and that is true. Um, and the reason for that is that it maximizes patient compliance. Uh, so that's the reason why um, drug administration, like the most preferred route is oral. And this question, which is, which of the following factors affects the absorption of drugs? And yes, the answer to this one is all of them. So the pharmaceutical form, lipid solubility slash ionization, molecular shape and size, and dispersion and dissolution um, are all correct in this case. So the next question is just a true or false about iron trapping. And the answer here is false. So I'll quickly, uh, I guess, go through iron trapping as a whole. So iron trapping is where molecules are less able to cross biological, biological membranes um, when they are charged, i.e. ionized. So this means that weak electrolytes will tend to accumulate in the compartment in which they are most highly ionized, um, not unionized. And for that reason, the answer here is false. And we've got one more question on pharmacokinetics. So this is bases are ionized in acidic conditions. True or false? Hopefully everyone gets this. And yes, the answer is true. So bases are ionized in acidic conditions and acids are ionized in basic conditions. Pharmacokinetics assists in Yep, so to explain this, I'll, I guess I'll quickly run through what is pharmacokinetics. Pharmacokinetics is what our body does to a particular drug. So that assists in deciding how much drug to administer to a particular patient, determining the starting dose, avoiding 
um, adverse drug interactions and preventing dose dependent adverse effects. Um, so all four were correct in this case. All right, so this is uh, quite a throwback from week six. Well, oh no, actually, sorry, you would have covered it this week, but this was in the week six. Anyway, yes, cells of the immune, immune system originate from hematopietic stem cells, um, which can be located in the bone marrow. So, yeah, there's a whole flow chart as well in the slides if you want to check that out. So what does the thoracic duct drain into? Yep, excellent. So the thoracic duct does drain into the superior vena cava. And if I'm not wrong, I do believe you will be covering this in anatomy next semester. So the real anatomy stuff. Um, and just to like, just to give a recap of the lymphatic system, which you would have learned, um, basically the overall message is that fluid moves from tissue into the lymphatics, into the blood. Oh, wait, sorry. Did we skip the question? Anyway, it doesn't matter. I'll just keep going. Um, so yeah, small capillaries become large vessels, which become afferent lymphatic vessels that drain to the lymph node. And, um, so valves stop the backflow of fluid and the muscles and thoracic movement allow movement of fluid without a pump. And afferent lymphatic vessels become the thoracic duct, which is a larger lymphatic vessel that drains into the SVC, superior vena cava, and thus into the blood. Yep. Pick the thing that is not a natural exterior barrier. Yeah, excellent. So, of course, natural killer cells are not a natural exterior barrier. They'll be more like an internal barrier, um, part of the actual immune system itself. Um, so exterior barriers are, sorry, they include lysozyme that's in, present in tears, the skin, um, flushing of urinary tract, mucus and cilia, and acid in the gut. And there's a bunch more, actually, if you decide to look them up. But these are the main ones. Which steps best summarize phagocytosis? It's a bit of a tough one because there's so many similar answers. Well, I think we can all agree, whatever answer you chose, that um, phagocytosis does start by luring in a pathogen um, and breaks it down so, and, um, and results in actually exocytosis, so not endocytosis. So to be clear, exocytosis is when you kind of dispose of something by throwing it, chucking, chucking it out, basically, of the cell. So I guess you could say that uh, phagocytes phagro are um, like femme fatales, they lure you to your death. So what TLR binds lipopolysaccharides in humans? Yep, TLR4. So this is a bit of a tough one. It requires some um, detailed memory, I guess. Um, so TLR stands for toll-like receptors, if you recall, which are a type of pattern recognition receptors. And pattern recognition receptors are, are themselves um, what recognize these things called pathogen-associated molecular patterns. So these are like, I guess they're kind of red flags that pathogens carry saying, look at me, I'm bad. Um, well, not really, but um, pa pathogen-associated molecular patterns are structures that are vital for the survival of pathogens and only the innate cells in our immune system recognize these patterns through pattern recognition receptors. So when the PRRs are triggered, sorry, expressed, then phagocytosis is triggered. And TLRs 
are of course a type of PRR, and there are 10 of 10 TLRs in humans. So um, some of them that we learn about include TLR5, which is what, what binds flagellin. Um, TLR4 is what binds LPS or lipopolysaccharides, which is a key component of bacterial cell wall, if I recall correctly. Um, and TLR3 binds double-stranded RNA. And uh, I don't even think TLR10 is a thing. I probably just, or it's not something we learn about anyway. I probably just threw that in there. But there are 10 TLRs altogether. So maybe there is one, just we don't learn about it. Cool. So what indicates to a natural killer cell that a body cell is infected with a pathogen? Yep, so lack of inhibitory signal. Um, so a pathogen, so a pathogen infected cell will not have an, an inhibitory signal. And this is what triggers the natural killer cells to detect them, if that makes sense. It's kind of like lots of negatives there, but lack of inhibitory signal is what triggers a natural killer cell to identify a pathogen. Yep, so what do eosinophil granules contain? Just have a think about this one. Correct answer is the green. Big clue there is that the yellow and green seem similar, so at least you could have got a 50-50 chance of getting that right if you figured out the trick. Um, so yeah, proteases and reactive oxygen intermediates are what eosinophils, eosinophil granules contain. Um, and just a recap of what eosinophils are, they are um, they're like they're white blood cells that have you know these granules which contain um, the stuff in the green answer, which is supposed to be toxic to pathogens, especially really large pathogens. So basically, eosinophils kill really large pathogens. And last question for today, what does the complement plateau do? Yep, so the complement pathway directly kills and recruits innate cells. So not adaptive, as opposed to adaptive cells. And, and um, just to be clear, complement pathway is a soluble component of innate immunity. So of course it would make sense that innate cells are recruited and not adapted. Uh, yeah, I think that brings us to conclusion there.